Hi, my name is Karen, and I'm an American lay student of Ajahn Sachat, or Pra Ajahn Sachat Abhijato, who has given me the very special honor of being asked by him to record this book for you. This book was written by Pra Ajahn Sachat's own teacher, the Venerable Acharya Mahabua Nyanasampano, and is a spiritual biography written by him about his teacher, the Venerable Acharya Mun Buridatta Tara. The title of the book is Venerable Acharya Mun Buridatta Tara, a spiritual biography by Acharya Mahabua Jnana Sampano. And it was published in 2005, translated into English by Bhikkhu Dick Silaritano. If you would like to learn how to download or get a hard copy of this book, or a list of which pages or chapters are read on each separate recording, please listen to the beginning of the first recording of this book. This book, in any form, is to be given away for free. Any ads you may see or hear in this recording have been put there by the platform you are using to listen or view with for its own revenue in exchange for letting us use their platform for free. Please forgive me for any mispronunciations of names, places, or words, as I'm still learning how to pronounce Thai and Pali, and for any background noises, as I'm just making these recordings in my apartment with an unruly dog and in the middle of a city. And we are continuing today. We're at the very top of page 37 in chapter 1, and we are still in the section titled Sarika Cave. One evening, Acharya Mun felt so moved by a profound sense of sadness that tears came to his eyes. Seated in meditation, focusing on body contemplation, his chitta converged into a state of such total calm that it appeared completely empty. At that moment, he felt as though the whole universe had ceased to exist. Only emptiness remained, the emptiness of his chitta. Emerging from this profound state, he contemplated the teaching of the Lord Buddha, which prescribed the means for removing the defiling pollutants that exist in the hearts of all living beings a knowledge arising from the incisive genius of the Lord Buddha's wisdom. The more he contemplated this matter, the more he understood the amazing sagacity of the Buddha, and the more profoundly saddened he was by his own ignorance. He realized the paramount importance of proper training and instruction. Even such common bodily functions as eating food and relieving ourselves must be taught to us. We learn to perform them properly by undergoing training and instruction. Washing and dressing ourselves, in fact all of our daily activities, must be learned through education. Otherwise, they will never be done correctly. Worse than doing them incorrectly, we may end up doing something seriously wrong, which could have grievous moral consequences. Just as it's necessary to receive training in how to take care of our bodies, so it is essential to receive proper guidance in how to take care of our minds. If our minds don't undergo the appropriate training, then we're bound to make serious mistakes, regardless of our age, gender, or position in society. The average person in this world resembles a young child who needs adult guidance and constant attention to safely grow to maturity. Most of us tend to grow up only in appearance. Our titles, our status, and our self-importance tend to increase ever more. But the knowledge and wisdom of the right way to achieve peace and happiness for ourselves and others don't grow to maturity with them, nor do we show an interest in developing these. Consequently, we always experience difficulties wherever we go. These were the thoughts that moved Acharya Man to such a profound sense of sadness that evening. At the foot of the mountain where the path to the Sarika cave began stood a Vipassana meditation center. 
the residence of an elderly monk who was ordained late in life, after having had a wife and family. Thinking of this monk one evening, Acharyaman wondered what he was doing, and so he sent out his flow of consciousness to take a look. At that moment, the old monk's mind was completely distracted by thoughts of the past concerning the affairs of his home and family. Again, sending out his flow of consciousness to observe him later that same night, Acharyaman encountered the same situation. Just before dawn, he focused his chitta once again, only to find the old monk still busy making plans for his children and grandchildren. Each time he sent out the floor of his chitta to check, he found the monk thinking incessantly about matters concerned with building a worldly life now and untold rounds of existence in the future. On the way back from his alms round that morning, he stopped to visit the elderly monk and immediately put him on the spot. How is it going, old fellow? Building a new house and getting married to your wife all over again? You couldn't sleep at all last night. I suppose everything is all arranged now so you can relax in the evenings without having to get so worked up planning what you'll say to your children and grandchildren. I suspect you were so distracted by all that business last night, you hardly slept a wink. Am I right? Embarrassed, the elderly monk asked with a sheepish smile, You knew about last night? You're incredible, Acharyaman. Acharyaman smiled in reply and added, I'm sure you know yourself much better than I do, so why ask me? I'm convinced you were thinking about those things quite deliberately. So preoccupied with your thoughts, you neglected to lie down and sleep all night. Even now you continue to shamelessly enjoy thinking about such matters and you don't have the mindfulness to stop yourself. You're still determined to act upon those thoughts, aren't you? As he finished speaking, Acharyaman noticed the elderly monk looking very pale, as though about to faint from shock or embarrassment. He mumbled something incoherent in a faltering, ghostly-sounding voice bordering on madness. Seeing his condition, Acharyaman instinctively knew that any further discussion would have serious consequences. So he found an excuse to change the subject, talking about other matters for a while to calm him down. Then he returned to the cave. Three days later, one of the old monk's lay supporters came to the cave, so Acharyaman asked him about the monk. The layman said that he had abruptly left the morning before with no intention of returning. The layman had asked him why he was in such a hurry to leave, and he replied, how can I stay here any longer? The other morning, Acharyaman stopped by and lectured me so poignantly that I almost fainted right there in front of him. Had he continued lecturing me like that much longer, I'd surely have passed out and died right there on the spot. As it was, he stopped and changed the subject, so I managed to survive somehow. How can you expect me to remain here now after that? I'm leaving today. The layman asked him, did Acharyaman scold you harshly? Is that why you nearly died and now feel you can no longer stay here? He didn't scold me at all, but his astute questions were far worse than a tongue lashing. He asked you some questions, is that it? Can you tell me what they were? Perhaps I can learn a lesson from them. Please don't ask me to tell you what he said. I'm embarrassed to death as it is. Should anyone ever know, I'd sink into the ground. Without getting specific, I can tell you this much. He knows everything we're thinking. No scolding could possibly be as bad as that. It's quite natural for people to think both good thoughts and bad thoughts. Who can control them? But when I discover that Acharya Mun knows all about my private thoughts, that's too much. I know I can't stay on here. Better to go off and die somewhere else than to stay here and disturb him with my wayward thinking. I mustn't stay here, further disgracing myself. Last night I couldn't sleep at all. I just can't get this matter out of my mind. But the layman begged to differ. Why should Acharya Mun be disturbed by what you think? He's not the one at fault. 
the person at fault is the one who should be disturbed by what he's done and then make a sincere effort to rectify it. That Acharya Mun would certainly appreciate. So please stay on here for a while. In that way, when those thoughts arise, you can benefit from Acharya Mun's advice. Then you can develop the mindfulness needed to solve this problem, which is much better than running away from it. What do you say to that? I can't stay. The prospect of my developing mindfulness to improve myself can't begin to rival my fear of Acharya Mun. It's like pitting a cat against an elephant. Just thinking that he knows all about me is enough to make me shiver. So how could I possibly maintain any degree of mindfulness? I'm leaving today. If I remain here any longer, I'll die for sure. Please believe me. The layman told Acharya Mun that he felt very sorry for that old monk, but he didn't know what to say to prevent him leaving. His face was so pale it was obvious he was frightened, so I had to let him go. Before he left, I asked him where he'd be going. He said he didn't know for sure, but that if he didn't die first, we'd probably meet again some day. And then he left. I had a boy send him off. When the boy returned, I asked him, but he didn't know, for the elderly monk hadn't told him where he was going. I feel really sorry for him. An old man like that? He shouldn't have taken it so personally. Acharya Mun was deeply dismayed to see his benevolent intentions producing such negative results, his compassion being the cause of such unfortunate consequences. In truth, seeing the elderly monk's stunned reaction that very first day, he had suspected then that this might happen. After that day, he was disinclined to send out the flow of his chitta to investigate, fearing he might again meet with the same situation. In the end, his suspicions were confirmed. He told the layman that he'd spoken with the old monk in the familiar way that friends normally do, playful one minute, serious the next. He never imagined it becoming such a big issue that the elderly monk would feel compelled to abandon his monastery and flee like that. This incident became an important lesson determining how Acharya Mun behaved toward all the many people he met throughout his life. He was concerned that such an incident might be repeated should he fail to make a point of carefully considering the circumstances before speaking. From that day on, he never cautioned people directly about the specific content of their thoughts. He merely alluded indirectly to certain types of thinking as a means of helping people become aware of the nature of their thoughts, but without upsetting their feelings. People's minds are like small children tottering uncertainly as they learn to walk. An adult's job is to merely watch them carefully so they come to no harm. There's no need to be overly protective all the time. The same applies to people's minds. They should be allowed to learn by their own experiences. Sometimes their thinking will be right, sometimes wrong, sometimes good, sometimes bad. This is only natural. It's unreasonable to expect them to be perfectly good and correct every time. The years Acharya Mun spent living in Sarika Cave were fruitful. He gained many enlightening ideas to deepen his understanding of the exclusively internal aspects of his meditation practice and many unusual insights concerning the great variety of external phenomena he encountered in his meditation. He became so pleasantly absorbed in his practice that he forgot about time. He hardly noticed the days, the months, or the years as they passed. Intuitive insights arose in his mind continuously, like water gently flowing along in the rainy season. On afternoons when the weather was clear, he walked through the forest admiring the trees and the mountains, meditating as he went, absorbed in the natural scenery all around him. As evening fell, he gradually made his way back to the cave. The cave's surrounding area abounded in countless species of wild animals, the abundant variety of wild plants and fruits being a rich natural source of sustenance. Animals such as monkeys, languars, flying squirrels, and gibbons, which depend on wild fruits, came and went contentedly. Preoccupied with their own affairs, they showed no fear in Acharyaman's presence. 
As he watched them foraging for food, he became engrossed in their playful antics. He felt a genuine spirit of camaraderie with these creatures, considering them his companions in birth, aging, sickness, and death. In this respect, animals are on an equal footing with people. But though animals and people differ in the extent of their accumulated merit and goodness, animals nonetheless possess these wholesome qualities in some measure as well. In fact, degrees of accumulated merit may vary significantly among individual members of both groups. Moreover, many animals may actually possess greater stores of merit than do certain people. But having been unfortunate enough to be reborn into an animal existence, they must endure the consequences for the time being. Human beings face the same dilemma. For although human existence is considered a higher birth than that of an animal, a person falling on hard times and into poverty must endure that misfortune until it passes, or until the results of that unfortunate comma are exhausted. Only then can a better state arise in its place. In this way, the effects of kama continue to unfold indefinitely. For precisely this reason, Acharyaman always insisted that we should never be contemptuous of another being's lowly status or state of birth. He always taught us that the good and bad kama created by each living being are that being's only true inheritance. Each afternoon, Acharyaman swept the area clean in front of the cave. Then, for the rest of the evening, he concentrated on his meditation practice, alternating between walking and sitting meditation. His samadhi practice steadily progressed, infusing his heart with tranquility. At the same time, he intensified the development of wisdom by mentally dissecting the different parts of the body while analyzing them in terms of the three universal characteristics of existence. That is to say, all are impermanent, bound up with suffering, and void of any self. In this manner, his confidence grew with each passing day. And we're going to go ahead and end there today. We are on page 42, and we will resume on page 42. About the middle of the page is the next section entitled Sawaka Arahants. Until next time, with Metta. Bye-bye.